But it is true. Like scientists are, you know, when they're described again, they're often said to be like children, right? You've heard this description. They're inquisitive. They're curious. They're passionate. They love them. And I'm like, yeah, and they don't play well with others. They're jealous. They're petty. They're selfish. They won't share their ball and they'll go home. Yeah. We, you can't, there's no such thing as a single edged sword. I wish there were, <laughs> you know, because you, we, we need some more of that because you got to dull it up. But in this case, he, uh, you know, I, I think when, when you have this kind of investment in, in science, it's going to be natural, but that doesn't mean we have to like, you know, feed the flames of co competition, you know, I'm like really venerable. If you go to the homepage of the NSF or the Department of Energy or the recently released National Academy of Sciences Future of Science for the astro Astronomical Sciences for the next 25 years or more, they talk about how many Nobel Prizes these different science things could win. Exoplanets, life, uh, the discovery of the CMB, B-mode polarization, the nice study. You know, that's figure two in this thing. And I'm like, what message is that sent to kids? Like, to young people? Like, that's what you should be doing so that you win this small, as you said, this prize given out by one hairless ape to another wearing a fancier costume and eating a reindeer. in the case of Nobel Prize, it's only currently given to three people. At most, which was never one of his stipulations. He actually said one. You could only give it to one person. So they change it. Why do they change it? I talk about, I speculate in the book. Oh, by the way, the book's only three chapters out of 11 about the Nobel Prize and its, its effect. But, you know, one of the things that's been so interesting, like I'm um, speaking, actually, this coming up in December is, the, is the, the Nobel Prize is given out on the day of Alfred Nobel's death. There's a lot of, and, and, and they bring in flowers, not from his birthplace, but from his mausoleum, which is in San Romino, Romino in Italy. Uh, it's a lot of like death fascination, you know, denial of death features heavily in the Nobel Prize because it's like what outlives a person? Well, science can outlive a person. My father has a theorem named after him. It's still, you know, in, in, you know, engraved in many places around the world. You or I, we can go to different places around the world. People know who we are based on our publications. We engrave things. We want to store things. We want to compress things. And I think that's, that's, there's something beautiful about that. But there is a notion of denial of death. Like there is a notion of what will outlast me. Especially if you're among the many 90 something percent of members of the National Academy don't believe in an active faith, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a creator, in a God. And, um, and science can substitute for that, but it's not, it's not ultimately as fulfilling. I just, I don't believe it can fulfill a person the way even practicing but not believing in a religion can fulfill a person. So, it, which is interesting because you, you do bring up Ernest Becker and the denial of death. Uh, in losing the Nobel Prize book. And there is a sense in which that's probably in part at the core of this, especially later dream of the Nobel Prize or a prize or recognition. I've, I've interacted with a few, um, you know, a, or a large number of scientists that are getting up in age. And there is the feeling of, of real pride of happiness in them from winning uh, awards and getting certain recognitions. Yeah. And I probably at the core of that is a kind of a mortality or um, a, a, a kind of desire for immortality. And that, that was always off-putting to me mm -hmm. as opposed to, I mean, I know it sounds weird to say it's off-putting, but it just, rather than celebrating the pure joy of, um, uh, now uh, solving the puzzles of the mysteries all around us just mm -hmm. the, the the actual the actual uh exploration uh of the mysterious yeah. for its own know, sake for its own sake yeah, yeah. well I, that's why i said you know it's like a scientist should okay you have to be careful and not have any you know physical it has to be platonic but you can think of of scientists and mentor. I have a chart in the book and in my, a plaque made by one of my graduate students, former graduate students. She's now a professor in New Mexico, Darcy Barron. And uh, she made this plaque and it has 17 generations. So here I am, 17 you know, levels down. There's a guy, Leibniz, not the famous Leibniz, different Leibniz, 1596 he was born. And I'm in this chain. And I don't know if you know this, but in the Russian language, the word scientist means someone who was taught. I'll say it very simply. Mm -hmm. One who was taught, right? Uchoni. Uchoni. So um, it probably means a guy was taught, right? <laughs> no. It could just mean a person. Uchoni. No, no, it's, some, it's, some, it's literally someone who someone was taught. Someone who was taught, right. Yeah. So what does that mean? To me, it has a dual kind of meaning, at least dual meaning. One is that you have to be a good student to be a scientist because you have to learn from somebody else. Two, you have to be a teacher. You have to pay it forward. If you don't, I claim you're really not a scientist in the truest sense. 
And I feel like with the work that I do in outreach and stuff like that, I'm doing it at scale. I'm influencing more than the eight, you know 24 kids I might have in my graduate class or undergraduate class. And they're, you know, potentially could reach thousands of people around the world and make them into scientists themselves, because that's the flywheel that is only beneficial. There is no competition. There is no zero sum fixed, uh, a fixed mindset versus growth mindset, um, because it is an infinite game. Imagine a, a culture that had none of the trappings of the negativity of the Soviet Union or pre-World War I uh, um, Germany or Imperial Japan, you know, science celebrated and we're just making like a nation of scientists and like we're not doing it to become multi-billionaires or necessarily, you know, for any mil military purpose whatsoever. But if we had that, you know, sometimes I'm flying, you know, home at night, like when you fly into LA, you literally, it's very rare. You can see like the number 10 million. Like it's very hard to like visualize things. That you, you see a brick wall, you ask how many bricks are there? It might be a thousand, two thousand. 10 million lights. There's 10 million souls. And you can see, and they're discreet. They're not like the Milky Way all blending together. Each lost in their own busy lives, right. excited, fall in love, afraid of losing their job, all that. By the way, people should know that you're a pilot. Yeah. So you literally mean fly. Yeah, sometimes you, I get to do it. Yeah. You get to look at the, <laughs> the, the eye of God perspective on these uh, 10 million, on these millions of and I often think they're like constellations, but upside down, like the city. It's like a constellation. <laughs> Hopefully I'll stay to keep the plane the right way up. But when you think about that, like imagine they're all working together and imagine like you always talk about love and, I, but like, you don't know, you don't know that they're not worthy of love. Like, so you're looking down on them and it's just amazing. Cause you think like what an amazing creation is man mm -hmm. and humans and what can we do? It's, it's phenomenal. It's so exciting. And then I get to do it, you know, it's a job I say, don't tell Gavin Newsom, but I do it for free. You know, I, I love what I do. And, but to think about like, oh, if my student succeeds and I'm not, no, it's, it's, it, it is unfortunate that you have experienced it. I've certainly experienced it. And I think there are ways around it. I think it is, a, it is a vexing problem because people want to, you know, it's very tempting to keep your own kind of, you know, garden fertilized. <laughs> you know, one thing that's interesting is like, I, I, you know, people are like, why are you doing this thing? And, you know, podcasts, and you're supposed to be a, you know, serious scientist leading this huge project and um, collaborators. And, and, and I'm like, well, most of what I do, as I said before, it's, yeah, it's for you, it's Velcro. For me, it's like, you know, wh what is the deal with the, with the safety standards on the truck that we're driving up to deliver the diesel fuel that will power the generator that will allow the concrete truck to, it has nothing to do with the Big Bang inflation, the multiverse, God's existence. It has nothing to do with that, right? So those are people I say I have to talk to. The people that come on the show, those are people I want to talk to. And that's super fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's a real honor that I get to do it. I'm using, I have some unfair advantages, right? I'm at a top university. We have people that's affiliated with the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation, you know, brilliant scientists coming through. And, but I felt like it would be kind of a, a, a shame if I didn't, you know, allow them to teach at scale because they're better teachers than I am.